Hi, uh, my name is Greg Ashman. Um, I'm very um, pleased to be here at this uh, Research Ed Perth conference, even though it's not in person, it's via recording, but you know, that's how things go these days. I'm going to talk a little bit um, about uh, explicit teaching and a model for how uh, it's used in the maths classroom. Now I'm going to um, put some appropriate caveats in here. I don't think that my maths department has figured all of this stuff out and knows exactly how all of this works. Um, but we've just got a few suggestions based on some of the reading and some of the work um, that we've done. So I'm gonna start sharing my um, screen. So um, uh, the session is called a model of explicit teaching in the maths classroom. Um, and um, the, 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 the thinking, a lot of the thinking that goes behind this, uh, and it wouldn't be right not to just give it a little bit of a plug. <laughs> a lot of the thinking that goes behind this um, can be, um, you can read about in my uh, book, uh, The Power of Explicit Teaching and Direct Instruction. That's actually my second book. I also have a, um, The Truth About Teaching, an Evidence-Informed Guide for New Teachers. And I also address explicit teaching there as well. So if you've got any interest in explicit teaching, um, then uh, you might be interested in these books. Okay, so when we talk about explicit teaching, uh, what do you mean? Well, this is an interesting question and the source of endless debates um, on the internet, actually, um, a lot of people are fans of uh, alternatives to explicit teaching, such as inquiry learning, for instance. Um, and um, one of the interesting things that has happened recently is that John Swetler, who uh, is the um, sort of founding father of cognitive load theory, which we're going to come to later, uh, released a report um, criticizing uh, inquiry learning. And in this report, he said that uh, when students have, uh, or when learners of whatever age have um, sufficient expertise at that point, and some of these activities um, that uh, look like inquiry learning become useful. And once this report was published, and it was explicitly criticizing inquiry learning, uh, a lot of people said, well, um, John Sweller is basically saying that it's a, it's a little bit of everything, a um, uh, bit of explicit teaching, bit of inquiry learning, it's all good. Um, why um, would anyone start a divisive debate um, about different teaching methods um, when everything works and the truth is somewhere in the middle and um, that sort of thing? And the key thing really, I think, uh, and I've been exploring the boundaries of this in my own PhD research, is that explicit teaching involves um, fully explaining and demonstrating concepts prior to asking students to use them. Um, that's really the foundational point. Yes, of course, in a program of explicit teaching, uh, learners will eventually have to solve complex problems on their own. There'd be little point in such a program if, that was not one of the outcomes. But the point is that they are explicitly taught how to do that before they're asked to do it on their own. And that's really the dropping off point. And what I think you also find when you get into explicit teaching, and I hope I'm gonna highlight that with the, the main example that I'm gonna use in this session, uh, that actually explicit teaching layers in additional levels of, um, of explanation. So uh, a straight level of explanation that um, one person might give to another to explain how to do something. Inquiry learning would remove some of that. No matter how scaffolded or guided, it's not inquiry unless you remove some of that. Whereas explicit teaching would add to it. So there really is um, a choice to be made. And of course, you can make different choices for different subjects in different contexts, but it is still a choice between two models explicitly teaching by fully explaining everything from the outset and not doing that. Okay, now, there are two main sources of evidence for explicit teaching. Two main, well, there's more than that actually, but there's, there's two that I'm gonna draw upon and, and maybe talk a little bit um, in, about in this talk um, before we get in, into the specifics. The first is a body of work called Process Product Studies. Um, and they are essentially uh, correlational studies. So they're not um, experimental studies. 
Um, they're not of that uh, nature. But what happened in this body of work that took place largely in the 1960s, but it, around the 90s as well, it's some, some in, into the 70s and 80s, uh, was that uh, researchers would go into the classrooms. They would go with clipboards with various things that they were looking for. And they'd design what those things are and they might um, come, come with different um, sets of, uh, of things to observe. But they'd go into the classrooms and they would observe essentially the teacher's behaviors. What is the teacher doing? Maybe what are the students doing in response? Um, and record those. And then they would look to see um, a correlation between particular teacher behaviors and student gains. Um, so what behaviors were associated with students making more gains in typically literacy and numeracy, but there are um, studies that expand beyond that. Um, typically um, primary school, but again, there are studies that expand beyond that. The other um, source of evidence, which I'm going to draw upon. Well, uh, it's a subset of, of the field of uh, more experimental evidence. And we do have a lot of experimental evidence uh, for explicit teaching, but a, a subset of that field, a group um, sitting in that field is cognitive low theory. And I like to talk about that because it's the area that um, I'm studying um, in my own research. Um, and so I feel um, it's got a lot to offer in this space. OK, I'll give you a moment to read this. Um, go. Okay, so hopefully you've all had time to read that. Now, this um, before I actually go on, why did I why did I pause and give you time to read that rather than immediately start talking about it as is um, the way usually in um, PowerPoint presentations? Well, if I started to paraphrase what was written on the screen while you were still trying to read it, you would then have a choice. Uh, you could either listen to me talk, um, and sometimes this is one of the tactics that I use in such a presentation. I, I, look at the ground so I just listen to the person and um, the other thing is I could just read the words and try and tune out from the person um, talking because both of those things are interfering with each other and we've only got so much capacity to um, pay attention to really one of those sources at a time so I gave you a bit of time to read that and hopefully I gave you enough um, this is um, an extract from teacher behavior and student achievement uh, it's a, a seminal work. You can get it. Uh, it's available on the internet if you Google it. Um, it's a quite an old PDF, you know, double line spaced um, by Brophy and Good, uh, Jer Brophy and Thomas Good, 1984. And it's a summary of a lot of this process product research. And you can see this is a section uh, called active teaching. So what they are suggesting is the process product research um, demonstrated the effectiveness of active teaching. And this is what they mean by active teaching. So students achieve more in class where they spend most of their time being taught or supervised by their teachers rather than working on their own and so on. Um, a, another guide to the process product research has become extremely popular uh, in recent years, um, popularized by um, uh, Tom Sherrington in the, uh, from the UK. And that is um, Rosenstein's Principles and Instruction. They're very uh, they're a very pithy summary of a lot of these ideas, although they don't quite, the, the uh, Brophy and Good don't quite fully align with um, Rosenshine in some places, but th they basically have the same message. And I think this is a really important point. When I trained, um, we, we trained almost under a paradigm where the teacher, the teacher prepared everything and then got out of the way. So the idea was that if you created, um, I remember one, uh, one of the things in the jargon was darts, directed activities related to text. So you create these activities 
often they'd be science activities because I was training at the time to be a, a, a science and physics teacher to create those activities. The students would do the activities and then you'd get out of the way and then the students would learn uh, from the activities. And I, I was actually involved in a little bit of research while I was training because it had become apparent to uh, many of the, uh, the researchers at the Institute of Education where I studied that if you ask students, for instance, to do a, an experiment, they start thinking about where the spatulas are um, how they can get hold of the iodine, where the drop trays are, um, and, and all the practicalities of doing the practical and not really thinking much about the science. So my job was to try and design this lesson. Um, and researchers came and videoed the lesson, actually, where I had to talk about um, the experiment. But then when the experiment was underway, I'd go around and basically hassle the students and try and sort of disrupt them thinking about, um, you know, mundane elements of how you actually do the experiment and trying to get them to think about the science. I think it was uh, testing um, uh, foodstuffs for starch. Um, and it was moderately successful, but it was it was quite hard work. And um, tellingly, the experiment we'd chosen was a very simple one. Um, what Brophy and Good are really telling us is that um, we can't hope materials, designing materials, designing activities, designing experiments um, is, and just doing that and that'll be enough. Um, that the more effective teachers in the process product studies actively carried the content to the students. They took responsibility for doing that. Um, they uh, delivered, I suppose, is the word, the content to the students. Um, and that was their responsibility, and they were very present in doing that. Okay, so that's a little bit of a brief summary of the process product research. Very, very brief. There's lots more to it than that. Cognitive load theory. I'll give you a chance to read that. So cognitive load theory. Um, it's a model, it, it was sorry, well, it isn't a model, it depends on a model, it depends on a simplified model of the mind. And it's very important that I stress that it's simplified. Um, all science proceeds by um, proposing models, uh, tests, make, using those models to make predictions, uh, testing those predictions, um, ideally, um, in an experiment, or if that's not possible against observations from nature. And, um, but all the models are models. They're not, none of them are full and complete descriptions of reality. We don't have one of those yet. The grand theory of uh, unified theory of physics still eludes us right now. So all models are approximations. Um, and I make that point because um, cognitive load theory focuses on two elements of the human mind. One is working memory. Uh, which is essentially the thoughts that we are consciously processing. So at the moment, I know I'm talking about cognitive load theory. Um, the other element is long-term memory. And long-term memory um, is essentially limitless and contains vast amounts of um, knowledge, uh, not all organized as in a filing cabinet, but organized more uh, in terms of the relationships between that knowledge. So networks of related things and how they relate to each other. And cognitive load theory, um, uh, well, is actually this, it's not controversial at all. Uh, so you don't have to accept the um, tenets of cognitive load theory to accept that working memory is extremely limited. That is not a controversial statement. And all academic learning, um, and that's maybe where cognitive load theory starts to make its own mark, all academic learning. Uh, so anything to do with uh, writing, symbolic representations of maths. Um, we haven't evolved uh, ways to learn those things through immersion because they're relatively recent. In evolutionary time, uh, writing uh, was only invented a few thousand years ago. For most of that time, only a, a small elite um, engaged with it. It's only a, a hundred or so years that um, everyone has learned to write. So we haven't evolved mechanisms for learning those things in the same way that we've evolved mechanisms, say, for learning our mother tongue. And so for those things, that, that academic learning that we haven't evolved to learn, it has to pass through this very limited working memory. And that creates a number of effects because our working memory can only really process about three or four items at a time. 
um, and can be easily overloaded. In some circumstances, um, learning cannot stimulate the working memory enough. So it's not a case that we should always reduce load. Um, in some circumstances, it might be appropriate to try and increase the load that is placed on working memory. But in many complex problems, mathematics, constructing paragraphs, uh, all, all these more complicated, interrelated, interconnected tasks where one bit of the task relates to another bit of the task that we learn how to do, we can very quickly overwhelm working memory. However, the good news is that long-term memory um, can um, run to the aid of working memory. If you have stuff stored in long-term memory in these rich networks, you can basically bring whole networks of ideas and process them um, without introducing any load on working memory. Um, so you can um, overcome the limitations of working memory by having lots of stuff in long-term memory. Uh, now, cognitive load theory does not have much to say about sensory memory. Um, it's not really a part of the model, um, it, but other um, cognitive science would, scientists would be interested in sensory memory. And clearly we have a sensory memory. The fact that cognitive load theory doesn't really talk about sensory memory, even though it exists, does not mean that cognitive load theory is not valid. It just means that its model is interested in these particular elements of memory as they relate to learning, working memory and long-term memory. Uh, cognitive load theory um, has generated a number of effects and there's lots of them and I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but I'll talk about a few key ones um, as they relate to uh, today's discussion. The goal-free effect is one that mesmerizes people. And um, basically, we're all um, sort of hardwired with a problem-solving strategy. Uh, and this is interesting because people often think that they can teach problem-solving in a general sense, but there's very little evidence that we can. We can teach uh, people how to solve specific problems in a specific context, and we all have a general problem-solving strategy. But, but whether we can teach other general problem-solving strategies or not is debatable. Um, and there's little evidence really that I'm aware of that we can. Um, but uh, this uh, innate problem solving strategy that we have uh, is called means ends analysis. So essentially, you know where you're trying to get. Uh, so you make a move. Um, and if you get closer to where you're trying to get, you say, okay, well, right, that's good. That's a good move. If you don't, you uh, go back and you try a different move. So it's sort of trying the different um, strategies out. Now, the goal-free effect works by basically not giving a, uh, sorry, and this is really cognitively taxing. So this whole process of um, visualizing the goal, working a step, seeing whether it gets you close to the goal or not, that, that pretty much occupies your working memory. And the goal-free effect, uh, there's a, a certain class of problems, often they're sort of uh, math geometry problems, where rather than say, find the angle here, find angle X or whatever, uh, you just ask students to find out as many things as they can um, about the, the example. And that reduces the load because it reduces the need to uh, do this, um, use this means end analysis. The worked example effect is uh, the effect where uh, uh, subjects learn more by being exposed to worked example and then asked to um, solve similar problems than they do by uh, being exposed to open-end problem solving um, using the same problems. Um, the, the, um, problem, the completion problem effect is very similar, except bits of the worked example are missed out for people to fill in. Um, and again, it's either, it's about getting this sweet spot of cognitive load. It could be that once you've done a few worked examples, fully worked examples, um, now uh, you can just up the load a little bit just to keep it in that optimum level by doing some completion problems. Or maybe if you already know those particular steps, so we're learning a new type of uh, problem, but we know some of the steps within that problem, uh, then we can ask uh, students to, to, do, to solve those steps themselves while also while still demonstrating the whole problem. Uh, this is a very maths context that I'm talking about here, but that's what this presentation is about. So I will make no apologies for that. I will use maths examples throughout, which is a relief for me because normally I can't. Um, split attention effect is um, if you've got a diagram um, and you've got an explanation of the, the diagram. And so you, the diagram is labeled, you know, with 
A, B, C, D, and there's a key that says A is this and B is that. You have to try and integrate those two sources of information yourself. Much better to actually have the labels on the diagram. Then as we go through, so the redundancy effect is what I was uh, talking about earlier with um, not giving you a text to read and also talking to you at this. Oh no, so I'm talking rubbish. That's not the redundancy effect. Oh yes, it is. Anyway, um, two sources of the same information um, uh, can, can cause interference and um, uh, over overload working memory. Um, but if we go over down this table, we reach some interesting ones towards the end. Element interactivity effect, expertise reversal effect, guidance fading effect. These all ab are about when uh, students start to gain expertise with a particular problem or problem type. The strategies that we were using when we were first teaching that problem type are no longer as effective. Why? Well, because they now have these networks of ideas in their long-term memory that they can draw upon. So they don't have to process everything in working memory. So the elements uh, that were interconnected in the problem that they had to try and solve beforehand, um, th they no longer have to worry about all that because that can be done in long-term memory. So for instance, a good example I would give is if you're familiar with maths and I said three X equals 18, you would think oh, X is six. You've basically done all of that using um, schemas in long-term memory. Um, if you had never learned maths at school, you wouldn't know what X meant or why equaling 18 was important or any of that sort of stuff. So to a novice, you've got the element three, you've got the element X, you've got the element equals, you've got the element 18. Uh, you've got to understand the, the equals as a balance between the two sides and not just put your answer here, which is something which is quite tricky in maths um, understanding initially. Um, and you, the, all the elements relate to each other. So you can't just do something to the three in 3x equals 18. You can't just do something to that. You have to, if you do something to that, if you say divide by three on that side, you have to divide the 18 by three as well. They're all interconnected. So those elements interact. And basically, as, um, as we gain expertise, um, we can do more and more of that th but through the, these networks of uh, concepts that are stored in long-term memory. So we, we need to process less in working memory. So we can up the level of demand of the task in, in other ways, maybe by giving problems to solve. Um, so now we know how to solve the problem, we can do so. Let's solve a range of similar problems set in slightly different contexts so as we can maybe with you know different types of, say with decimals now if we've been able we've been doing it with integers so we can get that greater range of experience um, and make sure that that is very robust so these are cognitive load theory effects now i want you to have a look at this um cartoon of my uh, with my classroom pets let's move the slide advance the slide please thank you So, so yeah, this is what bugs me. Um, people often say, yeah, but well, it's obvious we don't want to overload people. That's all obvious. It's hardly a theory at all. It's not, we, we know we don't want to overload learners um, with too much information. That's just common sense. Well, to which I would suggest, well, why do we keep doing it then? Why do we um, take novices and put them in an inquiry situation where they have to figure loads of things out themselves? Yes. If we give them lots of guidance, that will be better than not giving them any guidance. But why wouldn't we just explain the things that we want them to learn fully and explicitly from the outset? Um, so you often get this. Um, there's lots of criticisms of cognitive load theory because the more popular it's become uh, since um, the uh, New South Wales Centre for Education Statistics and Evaluation published a report um, in Australia and it's become more popular in the UK. Um, critics have started to find more and more things that they don't like about it. Um, and I could spend a whole presentation talking about that. One of the most important things I think that you might come across uh, is um, the idea that we don't have any reliable direct measures of cognitive load. Um, so uh, there's no sort of scanner that we can put on someone and sort of measure exactly what the load on their working memory is. And where we've tried to do that, we in the past, um, traditionally, people have just sort of said, you know, how hard little surveys essentially like asking you how 
much resources you put into something. Um, we are developing direct measures, but this doesn't really invalidate the theory at all because the theory is about instructional procedures. So it's not really about whether or not cognitive load is there in the working memory. That's the explanation that sits underneath it. But essentially the, the theory is about instructional procedures. It says we'll learn more from this procedure than that one. And so that's, the, the, that's what validates the uh, model, whether it makes accurate predictions about sequences of instruction. Um, but when people say, well, we can't directly measure cognitive load, well, that, that's been the case with lots of scientific theories, that the, 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 the thing that's been proposed, whether it's DNA or, uh, or um, neutrinos or, or whatever, they're not necessarily things that you can observe right from the outset. Um, and it's only later that people develop ways of doing that. Anyway, that's a, that's a little uh, diversion. Okay, so back, we'll, we'll, we'll go to what we do at Clarendon. So I teach at Barrett, Ballard Clarendon College. Uh, I'm head of maths there. Um, it's a independent school in Ballarat in uh, Victoria. So it's a country school. There's several elements what we do. We want a maths program that uses explicit teaching. So the first thing we do uh, before someone actually starts with us, we ask them to do some readings. And these are the current set of readings that we ask. Um, so we've got one minimal guidance during instruction does not work. Um, we've got, which is by Kirshner, Swell and Clark. Now this is a, uh, a seminal paper, um, lots of arguments about it. Um, which was probably beyond the scope of today's uh, presentation. Uh, it did it end, ended up leading to a book where um, people who agreed with the original authors and people who disagreed with them all, all sort of voiced their um, opinions and shared their research. Uh, and so I've got a post on my uh, Substack about that. If dueling papers, it's called. So if you want to read more about that, how obvious by Gregory Yates. Um, this is an interesting paper. It reflects a bit on the process product research um, and. Uh, this point that he raises that when he tells um, people about the uh, results of things like the process product research, say student teachers, they just say, oh, well, that's obvious. You don't need to be a researcher to know that, you know, you don't want to overload kids with new information or you want to. But it, so it is obvious, but people aren't necessarily um, taking into account those um, observations when they plan their teaching so it's it's obviously not that obvious uh strengthening the student toolbox Dunlosky, that's about things like retrieval practice space practice um i haven't really touched on that today but it is a, an important part of our program willingham uh, a couple of papers from willingham um on um on uh, one on teaching uh, thinking like a mathematician and that's not a skill you don't learn to think like a mathematician you you, you, get, you develop the ability to think like a mathematician by knowing lots of maths. Um, and uh, works as a problem completion effect, which is a chapter by Sweller, Ayers, and Cal Uger, which explores this work to example effect more because it's very important for us in maths. Principles of Instruction by Barack Rosenstein, which um, I've already mentioned, and The Effect of Teaching in Mathematics, a review of the research by David Reynolds and Daniel Mausch. Um, very useful paper in the context of maths. Um, and it's it's getting on a bit now, but it's still valid. It talks a lot about product process, re process product research, particularly um, re relevant to examples using maths. Okay, now, so that's the first thing we do. Uh, the second thing we do is we have a set of common materials. So in many schools, certainly that I've worked in, the teachers, basically plan and design all the uh, instruction individually. Uh, they will share resources um, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on, on the school. But it's essentially each lesson is the, um, the decisions about it are made by the individual teacher. Uh, uh, one teacher might spend three lessons teaching something that another teacher spends a lesson teaching. They might agree on uh, common time frames for assessments and things like that. What we do is we lock everything down. Um, that's why the padlock is there. I don't believe you can really uh, talk about the curriculum being explicit or not or anything else really, unless it's an object that you can that is clearly defined that everyone can see and look at. Uh, if we're not using the same materials, if we're using different ones, we're talking in the abstract really. And a lot of the 
important uh, decisions about explicit teaching are in the detail. Um, I think it was Zig Engelman that talked about the picky, picky detail, and it is the detail. So you can't just talk in abstract terms about, oh, yes, we teach explicitly and blah, blah, blah. So, in a, so therefore, you have to have a common set of materials that's built collaboratively that everyone commits to using. Okay, so here's an example of a, a sort of question that we might be faced with in I don't know, year eight maths or something like that was well, what our year eights would be doing anyway. Uh, find the equation of straight line with gradient four that passes through the point one two. Now, what I would have done uh, years ago is I might have even asked the kids to have a go at this um, uh, based on what they already knew. We've done, assume the students know what a straight line is, what an equation of a straight line is, uh, what the gradient means, what the point one two means. So assume they know all of that stuff. Well, if I assume they know all of that stuff, surely they could have a go at this. Um, let's have a go. Problem-based learning, let's work it out. Uh, that's not what we do now. Um, and when we first uh, moved over to more explicit types of teaching, we'd put something on the screen like this and we would demonstrate it. We'd, we've actually learned a little bit from um, the cognitive load theory research, um, which talks about example problem pairs. So this is an example problem pair. So we've got my turn and we've got your turn. Notice that the two um, questions are very similar. Um, there is not a trick that's slightly different in your turn to my turn. When I first used to teach, I would demonstrate a question and then I'd ask students to, to solve a question that was similar, but a bit different because why would they solve a question exactly like the one I've just done? What's the point in that? Well, the point in that is that you can check that they actually understand and can do um, uh, the, 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 the most basic level of what the, pro the problem requires. Um, and so it's very important that they are of the same format. So then what we would do as a teacher, we'd start solving this problem. So we go, I know um, it's going you know, to advance the slide, isn't it? So I need to write. I don't want you to advance the slide. So okay. So first thing we'll do is write, we'll write down the equation of a straight line. OK. Then we'll say, OK, so we know the gradient is 4. So m is the gradient. So we'll put that in. 4x plus c. OK, now we also know it's going to go through the point one, two. Let's write that down at the side. What does that mean? It means when uh, x is one, y equals two. So we'll put those in. So two equals four times one plus c. OK, so that means two is four plus c. So how do we get c on its own? Now, we've done some rearranging of equations, guys. So what we've got to have to do is we're going to have to take four from both sides. If we do that, we'll have minus two here. And that's going to equal c. So c is minus 2. So now we can write out the whole equation y equals 4x minus 2. Now, guys, I would like you to do the your turn, please. Um, put that on your mini whiteboards for me, please. OK, now that's a typical kind of instructional routine that we would use. Um, but actually, um, what I've done there is I've asked them to solve the entire your turn problem. Another alternative to that, and something that we use more and more with complex problems, rather than actually solving the whole your turn problem all in one go, if they're not quite at that level um, yet, then we might say, OK, and, and one of the things that we do is we use mini whiteboards. So we're using mini whiteboards all the time. All the students have mini whiteboards. And so we get a response from all students to every question, which is obviously much more efficient and it gives us a, a sense of what everyone can do and not just one person who we've asked. So if I was breaking this down, rather than getting them to solve the whole thing on the mini whiteboard, if I felt that I needed to break it down a little bit more, what I'd say is, okay, so first of all, guys, on your mini whiteboards, tell me what the value of M is. So write M equals on your mini whiteboards and tell me the value of M. Okay, so now, five, four, three, two, one, now, chin your mini whiteboards and by that that means that they hold their mini whiteboards up just underneath their chin and we can see what they've done and then you say okay right we've got that so um now i want you to write out um y equals mx plus c but i want you to replace the m with the value that we just did so do that on your mini whiteboards and hold them up right e excellent right now now let's move on so you can break the problem down into um what we might call a slow motion problem where you do every little step. And this is what I mean by saying that um, 
with explicit teaching, we can actually add in layers of instruction and layers of explanation in addition to the ones that we might have um, thought of initially. Um, now, how did I know to use exactly that method um, to solve the problem? Because there are several ways you could do this. Um, and what, you know, I've got this business here. Let me get my highlighter out. I've got this business here um, of writing the one, two at the side and underneath writing X equals one, Y equals two. Um, I'm not saying that's the ideal way to solve this problem at all. I'm, I'm not an expert, um, but how, how will we know that I will do that and the next teacher will also do that and not do it in a slightly different way, slightly different order, not write the one, two in brackets and the X equals one and the Y equals two underneath. Well, the way we make sure of that is on the very next slide, we have the entire procedure animated. This then means that in preparation for the class, all the teachers know the exact procedure that we want to demonstrate. So we're not confusing students by when they have Mr. A, um, this in year uh, seven, he does it this way. And then when they have Miss B in year eight, she does it that way. And uh, I've got to reconcile the two different approaches. And that's not quite how we did it last year. We're all using a common set of methods. And also we can test those methods. Um, when we look at assessments, we can see, well, actually this approach is more effective. Um, and so we can refine the methods as we go along. A teacher might have just added in a little bit of word explanation. Well, if that seemed to have made a, a difference for them, we can add that in and everyone can do it. Now, there is a danger uh, of doing this. And where's my slide? Danger, come on, danger. Um, and the danger, of course, is if you've got all the questions and all the solutions um, pre-prepared for teachers, that they might just rock up to class. And instead of demonstrating um, the way that I just did, writing it on the, the slide and talking it through and doing the think aloud, which we believe is very important. There's some research in the cognitive theory of um, multimedia, um, what's it called? Cognitive theory of multimedia learning, I think it is, that um, embodied um, approaches where an a actor, a, 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 an agent demonstrates um, the uh, solution and thinks aloud as they do it, that has more value. Um, so in, in, cogn in multimedia, this would be like an animated um, person that has more value than simply just presenting the solution. So we want people to demonstrate the solution. Um, uh, so how do we prevent them uh, from just um, not doing that and just showing the solution without really going through it all? Well, uh, you have to hold people to account. And you know, I think that you have to do observations. And um, But once, once you know exactly what you're looking for and you've got something that's well-defined, and you've got a, a specific set of steps that you want to see, I think observations become much more valid. Um, when observations fall down is when everyone's doing their own thing and it's not really clear what's better um, uh, or, or, or what's more effective or, or that your suggestion for doing it one way would be any, would be superior to a suggestion for doing it another way. But when you have very clearly defined what the expectations are, I think observations then play a role. So we'll just whiz through this one. I'm getting short of time if we're going to keep to 40 minutes. Um, and this is a, a, I'll just give you a chance to read that. So this is one of Rosenstein's famous principles. And I've got like a thermometer at the side there. And this baffled me when I first came across it. How could you um, possibly, how could you possibly obtain a high success rate? I mean, how is that in the teacher's control? Surely that depends on the students, whether they get it or not. Well, if we go back to what I was just saying, we can always break a problem down, like this problem here, there we are. We can always break it down further and further. If we wanted to, we could say to students, pick on your mini whiteboard, write y equals mx plus c, hold that up, let me see. Right, everyone, okay. Now, uh, what's the value of m? Write that down, four, four. Okay, some of you, you haven't got four. Okay, well, it's four. Okay, so now I want you to write y equals 4x plus c. So we can always get to a point where if we break it down enough, we can literally just start telling students, like if, we, if, we, if they're not getting that the gradient is 4, we say the gradient is 4, m is the gradient, so m is 4. Write that on your mini whiteboard. We can always get to a point by modulating um, what we ask the students to do and what we ask them to present to us 
of a, attaining a high success rate. Um, and, and what that enables, I, I think, is this, the, the motivation achievement uh, interplay. If you are hitting kids, particularly with maths, that they're really struggling to do and, you, and they're getting a low uh, success rate, that is quite demotivating for them. So if you can wind it back, a scaffold even more, put even more steps in uh, so that they do get that sense of achievement, that they are getting somewhere, I think that's important uh, motivationally as well. And, and also it, it, it gets people back on the bus who might otherwise have slipped off. So I think I'm coming to my time. So just um, to summarise, we have a system of explicit teaching. It's backed up by having a, um, a shared understanding uh, from a common set of readings that people do. I don't think I mentioned it, but people have to feedback. They have to write a paragraph on each of the readings so that um, we get a sense of how they um, appreciated that reading. We have a common curriculum and we always have the methods and the solution methods that we're going to use uh, defined so that we can um, be doing things in the same way. Okay, hopefully some of that made some sense. Um, if you want to... Um, get hold of me. Um, I'm on Twitter as at Greg Ashman. I've got a Substack, which is where my blog now lives, fillingthepanel.substack.com. I've got a podcast, which is at gregashman.podbean.com. And um, I've got um, a, a my old blog, my, which is now a sort of archive, is at gregashman.wordpress.com. Thank you very much. <laughs>